Hello and welcome to the Weight Free Wellness Podcast. I'm Tara Bachland, your hostess and the creator of the Weight Free Wellness Podcast and also the author of Universal Self-Care, Improved Health Through Self-Understanding. And you cannot believe how excited I am to have our first guest who is sharing a success story with us, his success story of weight loss. And, you know, with Weight Free Wellness, I really try to make a point that um, weight free doesn't mean primarily about losing weight or being free of weight is really more about an attitude. And what I hope you'll hear from guests, and I don't prime them, although my guest now today is hearing this, this um, preparation, but there's, from what I've, in my own experience and through working with others, there do tend to be underlying components. So I'm excited to see what he, is coming of this podcast Bob Davis is also a podcaster and is a, a good friend, a lively person, and I'm so excited to get started. So welcome, Bob. Hey, what's up? I'm Well, like I said, I'm excited and it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. It's fun to do this. It's fun to do conferencing stuff. It's really cool. Well, you know, I feel like I'm in your realm. You know, for so many times that we've had lunch and dinner and stuff, we're talking about your podcast, and now finally we're on my podcast. Everyone should do one. You know, I, they're wonderful. Is, well, you know, you learn so much along the way, not about only about technology, but about yourself. But uh, yeah, you do. We could even do a podcast about podcasting. Can we? At this yeah, point, I, I did one about podcasting. I try not to because I, <laughs> I I try not to, but I did do one, and it was like an hour long. I finally said I'm going to give advice to podcasters, and that was it was during a storm, and I'll never forget that. I had you could hear the storm raging because uh, I kept the windows open. So I have enjoyed that about your podcast that you bring in these sound elements, and it actually has inspired me. Just recently, I was thinking, how can I change things up a little bit? And I might try some of your tactics, if you don't mind. Well, you know, you could go outside and stuff. It's just that with video, um, you know, you're going to have issues with audio, which are, comp- you know, audio and video is much, it gets really complicated. It's just, uh, this is why there's 50,000 people working in television, because just <laughs> That's why we used to always laugh in radio because it took one guy and some paper to do, to change format in radio. <laughs> in television, you got to rebuild. You got to rebuild the set. You got to hire new. You know, yeah, all these crew. It's ridiculous. So that's funny because speak of set, I just noticed that my cat tree is partially in the background here. <laughs> well, maybe the cat will show up, and it'll be we'll have a cat as a guest as well, which is good. She usually does at some point. Right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with cats. In cats and the internet. That's a that's a great combination. <laughs> maybe maybe someday she'll do some kind of little uh, show, and it'll be totally impromptu. And she will get more views than you. I guarantee. <laughs> no. You put a cat on the internet, it's going to get clicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you hinted at it a little bit, but you have a background in radio. Yeah, I, I I've been in radio since I was a little kid, and uh, like twelve, and. I had my first job at 15 and and spent a lifetime in radio and then realized that the business was dying and started doing digital and podcasting. And that's what I'm doing now. And you know that story. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, maybe even just to tell the audience a little bit more about you, what what's this genre of your podcast? Oh, it's 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 news and current events. It's a general if, uh, topics podcast, which is a little more difficult because um, you don't have a specific focus, but I'm doing a lot more travel and uh, the political situation is just so depressing. It's trying to, to, to get a thread through the political stuff that's not um, picking a winner right now, which everyone is doing. And it's really hard to do right now. So I, I kind of veer off and do other things. When I get, when I get frustrated with politics, I go get in my, my 2000, you know, Ford Super Duty 450 ambulance and drive somewhere and do a podcast from some place, Galveston or something. Where were you last? I took a huge trip. I went, um, I went to the pipeline protest in North Dakota and then, and did a podcast there. And then I drove to Seattle and then I drove to Los Angeles down the coast from all the way down the, the, uh, well, California, well, U S one, and then the Pacific coast highway all the way down to Los Angeles and then then went to Phoenix and then came back up through the panhandle in the Midwest. So, um, and you know, I covered the primaries this year and I've been in that truck an awful lot. It has a hammock. I sleep in a hammock and it's pretty primitive because it's an old ambulance and it's still an ambulance. So, um, you know, it has the lights and everything and it's great. It's really fun. 
traveling is amazing. Well, I'm sure your stories get just so much more juice out of them because being there, you get such a different feeling for things rather than reading about something and then talking about it. Yeah, travel and especially covering these news events really opens your eyes to what's really, really what it's all really about. And it's all about getting television and coverage. It's not, there's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't want to waste a whole bunch of time talking about that in, in your thing, but it's, uh, I talk a lot about it in the podcast that there's almost everything is geared toward getting some kind of reaction. And when you actually go and see what's going on, it's not what it looks like on television. You know, and I don't care if it's a presidential election or a pipeline protest or whatever it is. What what you think that you're seeing is not what you're seeing. And what you think you're reading about is really not what you're reading about. So anyway. Well, and I actually don't mind getting a few taking a few minutes to learn about these things, but because I think it concerns all of us and especially the pipeline issue. Um, ever since I was a kid, I've had this real gut instinct like media, the typical media was not the way to go, like to not believe in it. You know, I would, I would have breakfast as a kid. I would watch the weather, which was, even though weather back then was horrible, it was probably more accurate than any of the other news, right? Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, well, no, to spend yes. <laughs> about as accurate as, as all the other news, which maybe is, about, yeah. they're, they're right about 46% of the time, maybe. So, well, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind just spending a few minutes on what you uh, what you observed on the on the pipeline issue. I mean, what is what we were seeing even on the internet? A lot of what was reflected, what was going on there. Well, if you listen to the podcast, what you're going to hear is um, them trying to control what the media reports, and what they're looking for is advocacy. When you go out there, they really don't want someone to report on what they see there. They want you to stay there. Um, and be worn down and accept their point of view, which is that all the land in North America is Indian land. Uh, That land is their land. Um, The pipeline is dangerous, whether it is or it isn't. You know, it's a man, it's a risk issue and it's a managed risk issue. I'm probably the only guy that included somebody from the oil industry in the podcast because I felt it was important to talk to somebody from the oil industry and not just accept a certain point of view. Um, They certainly have the right to protest. But one of the uh, Native Americans there told me that, you know, everyone's talking about all these sheriffs and and the National Guard and everything. And you'll hear it in the podcast. The guy. uh, So when you go there, you're driving down this road that leads to Standing Rock and you go through a National Guard checkpoint and then you come to a camp. And I thought, well, is this the camp? But this is only the forward camp. And this was this was uh, in October. So the weather was still pretty good. And uh, there's a bunch of young guys out there. Uh, from the tribe. And the first thing he told me was, we want the National Guard here because they're keeping us from interfacing with the security guards from the oil company. And the, uh, the, you know, the statement was they're bad people and they're, they're a private security company. And, and I thought to myself, well, I mean, okay, but what's a private, what's an oil company going to do? They're going to hire a private security company and they're not going to just hire Bobos. So, and it's this whole thing about how all these people are militarized and and the whole point of the sheriff's deputies and the different county sheriffs being out there and the National Guard being out there is to ensure the safety of those protesters, which, by the way, is why I think the president finally said we're not going to we're, we're going to basically put the kibosh on this thing for a while because there there are a lot of kids out there at this protest uh, who are not going to survive 40 below zero weather and 40 mile an hour winds in North Dakota. And it's it's up on a hill, which is even worse because they're not really protected. And the camp is not ready for winter uh, under any uh, expectations. So uh, I, I think the idea is that, and, and quote unquote, they won, but the pipeline's going to go through because we, we need energy security and, and uh, the, the oil is going to come out of the ground and it's got to go someplace. They wouldn't give me a straight answer on any positions. Like I said, uh, you know, what about what about the trains? You know, in Minnesota, we're worried about train cars full of oil causing oil spills and problems. And their answer was, well, we shouldn't be pumping any oil. And it's like, well, that's not an option at this point. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell. But I, I was most struck by their efforts to control who you talk to, what you see, and what you report on. You're not allowed to take pictures of this. You're not allowed to take pictures of that. Uh, you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, as a citizen journalist, this is a 
this is a First Amendment protest. Um, the land that they're on is uh, is uh, under questionable ownership. Uh, you know, I don't know who owns that land. They can't stop me from recording. And I think that the antidote to big media is citizen journalism, like we're doing right here. Uh, the minute I roll up, I don't care what it is, and I, I learned this a long time ago, I'm rolling. And whatever you say, as far as I'm concerned, is on the record. So I got things on that podcast that nobody else got because uh, I recorded them basically telling people what they can say and they can't say. And these media people are so compliant. And they did the same thing in the primaries, same situation in the primaries. We're going to control access. And it's like, you don't tell me that. I'll climb over the fence. You know, I will, I will sneak in. And I will be recording when you throw me out because uh, you can't tell me when it's a presidential campaign or any kind of a protest. You're not going to tell me what I can record and can't record, period. That put me off right away. So that's my story from the, the pipeline po- protest. Well, that's great. You know, there is so much power in this independent broadcasting. And um, I, I think, you know, the more we tune into those people that we know and trust, you know, in the the independent pro- broadcasting realm, you know, we can get good information. We don't have to rely on these these big um, media companies. And well, yeah, everybody has a point of view. But um, I think people that are, first of all, broadcast media is dead. So this is the new, this is the new talk, what totally. we're doing. And uh, this is the new, nobody listens to the radio anymore unless they're 75 years old and they don't understand how to get podcasts on their phone. Or we talked about that a hundred times at dinner mm-hmm. so, and that's just intensifying. So uh, the, the hard part is that it's a maw of podcasts and people and people choose what they want to listen to based on what they think, which is fine. I, I don't have a problem with that, but um, I don't think that the big cable news channels and the big media channels are, have very long to live. I think they're going to be gone soon. They're going to have to figure something else out because that paradigm, that business model is not is going to stop working because people don't, they just don't trust them. Well, even with the onset of so much live, um, the promote, you know, Facebook, even promoting the use of, of live, live stuff. Oh yeah, I haven't done, I haven't gone live yet because I don't, I just don't want to be the guy that goes live from his kitchen. I did. I do have a YouTube channel where I put up, stuff for my travels, which is kind of fun, but I won't put any political stuff up there. Mm. Um, I'm afraid to go live because I, I just don't want to be the guy going live from his kitchen. Hey, here's my dog. I mean, it's, I just don't, I want to try to figure out what to do with it. Have you gone live? I have and incidentally it has been in my kitchen, <laughs> <laughs> but I do do cooking stuff and that kind of thing. And, or I gravitate towards the dining room because, you know, that's more, uh, the lighting is better or something. Yeah. But, Everybody's a, yeah, we're all a TV, everybody's a TV station. That's, that's the, that's the hard part. So, yes. So, so, so yeah, let's talk about whatever you wanted to talk about. We don't you know that, talk about me. Thanks for sharing that because I, I, maybe this was more of a dinner time conversation too. And um, I love the uh, expansive talk, but you have shared with us over time too, uh, or when we've all had dinner together and I should include that, you know, it was me, you and my husband. Yeah. John Buck. And we did business together and, and uh, we, would, we would go to our favorite Asian restaurant and, and just eat huge amounts of food and drink, and drink uh, Vietnamese coffee. That yes. was, yeah, I've been there in a while. I need to yeah. get over. We'll have to do that again for sure. And yeah, last time we were in there, they're like, where's Bob? <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't live with us. <laughs> well, you know, what happened is I had to, I had to put, I had to slow down on the Asian uh, the you know the egg rolls and the and you and my favorite was the the pot stickers because I was getting a food baby and I just I it, I mean it was very small but I I was like I got to stop eating this stuff this is this is not good because actually I had you know the the whole story is I stopped eating carbs like I stopped eating all carbs and you know my friend the yoga teacher was finally like you have to eat brown rice or you're gonna die you can't. Uh, and I lost like 45 pounds. And when when we started going to that place, I hadn't even had any. My favorite food is probably pho. I mean, they call it pho. I call it pho. But you know what I mean. And, of course, pot stickers and right. I love that stuff. And there's nothing more fattening than than Chinese food, right? So uh, that I was like, I got to stop doing this once a week. And I still get pho once a week. But, uh, you know, I, I really have to think about strategically plan when I'm going to have the foe because, um, you know, it's, it's, but yeah, I went nuts. I, I, I 
you know, I, I apparently it's OCD or something where I'm able to stop. Like if I want to stop smoking or whatever, I can do it. So when I put my mind to it, okay, no more potatoes. I haven't had potatoes in, you know, like I had some at Thanksgiving, but I, I, I don't have anything like that ever. No potatoes, no potato chips, no, none of that. And, uh, and you live in Minnesota too. So like potatoes are our staple. <laughs> oh yeah. And noodles and um, hot dish and everything has starch in it. And hot so dish. or in other parts of the country is called covered dish, right? <laughs> is that what they call it? Covered dish? In, hot, in, in the, the middle, South. Hot dish. In the South, they call it covered dish. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's got egg noodles in it. I mean, whatever we call egg. I don't even know what they are. Are they egg noodles? I don't know what they are, but they starch is what they are. Yeah. And, you know, I, I survived on a diet of meatloaf and mashed potatoes and you go to a restaurant and they hand you bread and I'd eat it all and then get more. And just like everybody else. Um, and, uh, I just, I just, uh, what caused me to stop doing that? Oh, I know what it was. I wanted to go back to yoga and I'd been out of yoga for a long time. And I just, my, I didn't want, I was not going to go to yoga with a big fat belly and do yoga. And so I just decided to stop eating carbs first because I heard uh, somebody gave me a book on the Atkins diet and I never used the book. I just kind of figured out that you're not supposed to eat carbs. Well, and what a lot of people do is they, they kind of, well, I'm going to eat, wean myself off carbs. I just quit Mm -hmm. and you get dizzy and you're confused and you sleep a lot for about two weeks and then you don't even miss it anymore. So. So let's go back to the beginning. You've, you've actually lost 40 some pounds and kept it off for what, four or five years. Oh yeah. It's a, it was a lifestyle choice. You can't, you can't go on a diet. It's like, you know, I've lived long enough that finally I was just like, well, you know, I can have potatoes at Thanksgiving or whatever, but, and if I went in Rome, but uh, the main thing is not to be in Rome, you know, and, and uh, just stick to a very, you know, to be disciplined about what you're doing. And I am very disciplined. I don't eat carbs, you know, unless I absolutely have to. So paint a picture for us. Uh, I mean, if someone's watching um, this podcast right now, they can kind of get a visual for you. I mean, you have a slim face. Um, but, you know, five years ago, who's, what's the picture of Bob face. Davis then? I had a fat face and a big belly. Typical male, you know? I didn't, and chicken arms, kind of. I mean, I didn't really, uh, I had done, I, you know, I did Bikram for, Bikram yoga for, I don't know how many years, I guess. I used to run three miles, ride my bike to work, which was eight miles. Both so it was 16 miles a day of biking, running, uh, and and I didn't even I never like didn't I never took a trainer or got I mean I would watch people so I would did it the dumbest way that you could possibly do it which is I don't no nobody can tell me anything I'm going to figure it out myself and uh, you know I I was running I was biking I was doing sometimes two Bikram yoga classes a day which are as you know are 90 minutes in a hot room and. I was eating everything in sight, you know. And Bikram, for those who don't know, is a really active, it's like cardio, it, it's like, it's an intense yoga class. This is not the ones where they're playing the light music and the dinging the bells, maybe at the end, but 90 minutes of an intense, intense workout. I love it, but it's, uh, it, and it's really competitive. People don't, you know, yoga is supposed to be all like, you know, but when you do, when you do Bikram, you're standing in front of a mirror with 12 other people and there's 12 people behind you and 12 people behind you, super hot in the room. And I don't care who you are, you're going to get super competitive doing Bikram until you get your practice to the point where you don't see other people. That's the challenge. And, uh, it, I loved it. And I started, I was doing it. I would get up and I would do my thing and I would go, or I would go to Bikram first, then do all my other stuff, then ride my bike to work. I was working 10 to midnight at the radio station. And then I ride my bike, and then I would go before I went to work. I would I would uh, uh, do do it again, and then go to work. Stop at the the Vietnamese food place, eat the pho with the egg rolls and the spring rolls. Go to work, come home, have go to Little Cheese in uh, in Whittier in Minneapolis, and have tacos and you know <laughs> a cheeseburger and fries, and then come home and the next day go out for breakfast. You know it was nuts and eat enormous amounts of food because I was hungry all the time. And I just burned out and I didn't do anything for like four years, five years. And then I wanted to go back to core power. And I was just, I had this giant belly and I had, it's kind of a hereditary in my family, this belly. And so I I was like, I can't go back to yoga like this. I just can't because I couldn't do anything. Couldn't hardly even bend over. 
And I think I weighed, I never weigh myself, but I think at that time I weighed something like 196 pounds and I probably weigh one at the most 160 now. So that's kind of where I'm at. They're 35, 40 pounds lighter. And now the weight is just from doing yoga every day, sometimes again, twice a day, but it's now I'm doing different kinds of yoga. So I don't do all of that, but that was the motivation. And uh, somebody came into the station that was a guest and they had this Atkins book and he, he'd lost a lot of weight. And he was like, Hey, this is how I did it. Here's the book. So I took the book, read about six pages and went, okay, you know, and so the whole deal is no more carbs. Boom, quit. And everybody thought I was crazy. And the, when you do it, uh, it, uh, now, you know, the details of this, but I don't as much, but your body starts to eat the fat. So, uh, and then you need fat after you lose the weight, you need the fat to survive because your body survives by eating the fat. So the first couple of weeks of that are really, is really difficult because you're, you're, uh, you're tired and you're dizzy and you think there's something wrong. And everybody I know that starts this diet, they run to the doctor and the doctor says, oh no, you've got to have carbs. You know, you can't survive without carbs. And then they go, they get fat again. Mm -hmm. Well, I just said the hell with it. I don't care if I die. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'll die thin. So that was it. And I, you know, until my friend Jesse told me, you got to start eating brown rice at least. Um, I have, you know, so I'm kind of gluten-free, although I don't have a gluten problem. Um, and I don't drink beer. I don't drink alcohol. That's the other thing people don't realize when they go to lose weight. You can't, you have to stop drinking because if, especially beer is, that's like having six potatoes, right? Um, and uh, you, you can't drink pop. I never drank pop. I mean, I quit doing that a long time ago, but you can't drink any kind of Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, especially Diet Pepsi, whatever. You got to quit iced tea, any of that sweeteners. You got to quit all that stuff. And I did. And, uh, you know, I lost really fast, lost 40 pounds and then started going back to yoga. And I was really happy that I didn't have a giant fat belly. So you had started, you were working out vigorously for quite some time and yeah. then kind of took a sabbatical gained some weight, wanted to go back to yoga, um, but we're em embarrassed, it sounds like, which I is so, so I common. Huh? That's the people won't go to yoga because they're too fat. Well, or even s certain classes, right? Right. right. Yeah, well, or, or just not capable. You know, I almost didn't go to, um, for a long time, I didn't go to dance class, which is has been really helpful for me in a number of ways, but I was embarrassed because I was not naturally coordinated. I mean, for me to learn right from left was already difficult. Oh yeah, me so, too. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes you have to push yourself to yeah. go into that situation, and and soon after you'll be you'll feel the accomplishment. Yeah, it took it's. Uh, I mean, yoga you feel a sense of accomplishment right away, but nobody wants to be naked in a room of people that. I mean, you're not naked, but you may as well be. You know, uh, when when you've got a giant fat cut hanging out it's just no guy wants that it's so embarrassing and you know so i don't have to worry about that anymore so that's the thing. now i just have to worry about figuring out how to do side crow that's my <laughs> well yeah side crow is not an easy one that's for sure <laughs> that's... well what's cool about that is that's all abdominal muscles and you know it's a you're constantly learning every day every time you go to yoga you learn oh that's what that I'm learning. I learn every day. I'm learning that it's not, you're not supposed to throw your whole body into it. It's really about what muscles you use. And you, you go that, that hurts, that hurts the next day. And you're like, I know why that hurts. Cause I haven't used that muscle in 35 years. You know, and since I was a kid trying to scramble up a tree or, or something yeah. like yeah, that, I, you know, use stuff. Um, so, you know, you're, uh, you're originally from Chicago, so you're a Midwestern guy, yep. and it might sound like in this podcast podcast that I'm really, really promoting yoga because I've talked about it so many times already, but it's more from like when you find like a great restaurant, you're like, you have to go there. Yep. <laughs> you know, you're like, I don't care if you don't like Asian food, you've got to try this one. Yep. And it's really much more like that, but I'd like to hear from you, like how, you know, how did you get into doing yoga at all and how did you maybe did you have to get over being a midwest guy and be like i'm i don't do yoga <laughs> yeah i thought yoga was uh weird and i i i was living in chicago and i started going to the gym uh because somebody when i was in minneapolis my my backdoor neighbor gave me a rowing machine because he was throwing it away and i took this rowing machine and i 
I hadn't exercised, you know, I was like 36 and I had never, ex- I'd never exercised. I mean, I walked a lot and, uh, you know, I was kind of a hippie then, and I never did any exercise. And I got this rowing machine and I was really heavy. I mean, I was my, the pants, I was wearing th- size 38, like khaki pants. And I started rowing and, you know, I made up my mind I was going to row like 20 minutes a day. So I wrote, I wrote on that machine until I broke it. And then when I broke the machine, <laughs> you know what I did, I actually took it to the Virgin Islands with me because I wanted to be able to row. And I remember I, I checked it through luggage and brought it with me. And we ended up running over it because we forgot that we put it in a driveway when we left this house we were staying at and, and it was broken. So that was the end of the rowing machine. And it, that was about a year and a half, two years later. So then I started going to uh, the gym in Chicago. And I would just go on the recombinant bike or the uh, the recombinant thing or the rowing machine. Um, and I remember I started trying to do something. I don't know what it was. And they had yoga classes there. And I think I took a couple of yoga classes there. Then I started taking yoga at this weird gym. We lived near Boys Town in Chicago on the north side. And there was this weird gym uh, up the street from my house on Broadway. And I used to go up there and we did yoga in the, this back room way up in the back. And it was a shanga. And so I, I did that a little bit. And then when I moved back to Minneapolis, um, I was riding my bike to work to go to the radio station because I didn't have a car and I was riding my bike to work. And I passed this yoga place that was, that was opening on the greenway in Minneapolis. And it, I was like, I thought it was going to be a bar. And then I saw that it said yoga and I, Oh my God, that's a yoga place. I wonder if it's open. I should go check that out. And I wa- happened to walk in the day that they opened and it was Bikram yoga, the first Bikram studio in, in Minneapolis. And uh, I was there the day that they opened. And I remember I, um, I wore my shirt because I didn't. <laughs> and Martha was like, you need to, you're probably going to want to take that shirt off. No, I don't, I don't need to take this off. And it was, <laughs> it was literally like it had come out of the washing machine. It was sopping wet uh, and I, I don't remember what I wore home. I think I bought a t-shirt or something to wear home, but, uh, I was hooked. Like that was, that was, I was completely hooked. And that was the whole beginning of this Bikram Odyssey where that's all I did. And, um, I think it's the best thing ever. And now I go to uh, core power or to, I still do Bikram when I'm traveling. I'll go to different yoga studios when I, when I travel, but you know, all kinds of yoga. So I, now I'm back to more Ashtanga type yoga. So vinyasa and, uh, and sculpt and and then they do two different hots at CPY, which they have a thing called an HPF, which is a hot power fusion, which I don't understand to be quite honest. We talked about this. It's the weirdest series. It's kind of a, a fusion between vinyasa and the hot series, which doesn't make any sense, but what the hell? Um, yeah, I do it because it's hard. I don't want to do it. So that's why I do it. And then sculpt is, you know, quite a challenge for, you know, older people that, and I'm not young, I'm certainly not 26 years old. It's uh, tough for me. I don't go to a sculpt cl- class. They're just in, they're so intense. Hot power fusion is about as intense as I go. <laughs> HPFs are really intense. Any yeah. of that. I mean, C1s are intense, which is the introductory, not even heated in the room. Right. You know, it can be really intense. But once you start practicing every day, you want that, you know, and I, I religiously practice every day, sometimes twice a day because of what it does with everything else. Um, and I, I just, you know, and I've continued, I do eat carbs. Like I ate rice today for breakfast and I, I have to eat carbs on the day that I do a sculpt. So this is a sculpt day. Um, you know, I, I, I make tacos and I'll use, you know, I did use the rice, uh, what do they call them? Um, tortillas, but I, I still use the flour tortillas, but, um, when I make tacos, but generally I don't eat carbs at all. A lot of salads, a lot of broccoli, a lot of kale, a lot of green beans, but also a lot of bacon and steak and uh, hamburger and <laughs> chicken and stuff like that. But I don't eat any carbs still. And I can always tell when I'm getting, you know, you can sort of see it. But I read a thing yesterday that said, uh, it was on Facebook. Some guy posted something on Facebook. It was a board from some coach that said, if you're in pain or if you're sore, not pain, but if you're sore, if you're tired, if you're, you know, sluggish, then you're probably not eating enough. And if you're, if you, if you have a food baby, you probably overeat. So 
because he was saying his young athletes don't know when to eat and when not to eat. And, and so he was saying, just if you're sore, then start eat. I come home sometimes and, and make a steak and the next day I wake up early and it's amazing what a difference concentrated protein makes. So, right. Or even an Epsom salt bath or really support your bat- body. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever tried them? <laughs> well, that really, well, that an Epsom salt bath is a big, is a good thing. Huh? It's a good thing. Yeah. Especially when you're sweating all your minerals out. <laughs> so you, um, I think a while back you had done my body typing assessment, hadn't you? Yes. Do you happen to remember your, your general makeup, earth, fire, air, water, or like what were the top two? We decided I was almost all fire. That's what you decided for the most part. Well, it makes a lot of sense just given the the type of workouts you like. I mean, a fire person can do all the workouts that you're talking about. Like they almost have to have that intensity where someone like me, it just wears me out. You know, I have to balance it with, I have to do more of the, the gentler yoga. It just it astounds me how fire types can just keep going with those intense workouts. I, I, you know, I'm intense and I, I have to have that. But the one thing I've, I have learned from other people is you don't, you don't have to be intense in the yoga class. I mean, there are a lot of people who they're just, they don't, <laughs> it always astounds me that there are people that are just like, yeah, I'm just here doing yoga. I'm not going to worry about it. And I'm like, you know, so like pissed if I don't get side pro or if I can't do this or if I can't do that. And I'm, I'm letting go a lot of, of a lot of that, but it's, and figuring out that it's working muscle groups, but you don't have to hit it really hard. You can just have a nice relaxing yoga class. I can't do that. I have to, you know, I I'm super intense about it. And it's just funny because everybody's different. So I still think every day is really, really, really a good thing. I think that's, you know, really important. Um, in my own, and I don't care what it is, whether it's, you know, if you vary it, run one day and I can't run anymore, but, uh, because rather than God forbid, I would read a book or find out how to actually run right, you know, and buy the right shoes. I just ran and destroyed my knees. So, you know, I'm lucky if I can do squats or, or, uh, lunges. So anyway, how are your knees now uh, in yoga class? They're better. I mean, I can, I can do Utkatasana. I can do, I can, uh, you know, I can do Bikram Utkatasana, which is horrible, you know. Yeah. Um, Here I can, pose, which is is kind of a, a, a standing squat. What is that? Position. Just to kind of elude for, uh, describe for our audience who may not know Utkatasana. Utkatasana is yeah. chair pose, basically, you know. And you you have to bend your knees. And if you're really going to do it right, you should get your down as far as you can get it. But uh, uh, I hope that's okay to say that. But <laughs> you can get your, your booty down as far as you can get it. It's hard because you have to lean back and, you know, you got to take the pressure off your knee. But if you're unsteady, it's hard to lean back. It's, it's, it's the way Bikram does it. You spread your, your feet out. So your feet are, feet are at hip width distance. And then you sit down in a chair with your arms out and it's, it's, no one can do it. No one can do it. But it's an imaginary chair. It's not a real chair. Right. And people are like, she does a better chair than I can. And she's like, I can't do this. Nobody can do it. And then you, and then the next, there's three elements to this. And the next thing you do is they call it awkward chair pose. So the next thing you do is you stand up on your toes and then you, then you, you come down in a chair with your, with your heels up, which is really difficult to do. And that puts a lot of pressure on the, and you really got to lean back on that one. Cause if you don't, your knees will just scream. And then you put your knees together heels still up that well they're going to come up anyway and then you do that and then you do that again and you bounce all the way down so you bounce a couple of times when you're all the way down those are impossible well i could never do that when i was running i couldn't my hamstrings were so tight my knees were so i i could go down like maybe a foot and now i can go all the way down and i can do lunges but it's painful you know i mean after a while i it's painful the next day so well, that's tremendous i mean you're basically doing uh, close to advanced yoga. I mean, in a lot of, especially in Minnesota, it's pretty advanced. You know, if we're in California, it might be intermediate. Right? You know what's interesting about Minnesota? Minnesotans are super intense. I've done yoga all over the country and I've done yoga at Core Power all over the country. And we have a very intense community here and a very experienced community. And it's, I mean, I'm not even including myself in that. These are people who you know, you go to classes and, and I used to look down on, I would only do one kind of yoga. I'm only going to do the hot. And then we had a, a sculpt class cancel one day and we were doing the HBF and I was like, this is my territory and I'm going to show these people what I can do. And these sculptors came in and they kicked everybody's ass. And I was like, 
I have to go do that. That's what I have to do because if those sculpt people can get through an HPF and do as well as they did, then that's what I have to do. So um, where was I? Oh, but I'm, you go to Kansas city and it's, it's like, so they have these things called core power and this is a core power thing, but they have introductory yoga, which is basically a C1, which is not easy, but it's not heated. C2s are more power yoga, you know, vinyasa, ishtanga type poses. And then um, they have the sculpt and then they have the HPFs. And in San Francisco, they have something called a C3, which is supposed to be this really challenging class. And I took, I was like, oh, C3, I'm going to do this when I went to San Francisco. It was the only class I could take when I was in San Francisco and I was rolling out. And I went in there and I thought it was going to be really hard. It was like an easy C2 in Minnesota. So people... Minnesota are pr- really intense when it comes to what they do. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it would be hard to leave Minnesota and not be able to have that level of intensity. Even LA is not that intense for, for yoga. And they do, they, I mean, there's people all over LA doing yoga. The yoga classes are packed, but here in Minnesota, people are super intense about that stuff. And I don't know why I, I, it's, Really interesting. I don't know why, but they are. We're, we're, we're stuck indoors half of the year, you know? <laughs> so gonna... like, I'm getting in there. I'm going to sweat because I'm sure not going to sweat at home. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. So um, that's really fascinating. So I just kind of want to summarize a little bit. For So first of all, it was not so much for about the weight for you to begin with. It was, it was kind of more about, was it about feeling good and looking uh, uh, being in a performance state for going back to yoga. Cause it sounds like you, you wanted to look good enough to go to yoga so that you could feel good about yoga. I just was like, I am not, my dad and my uncle both had giant bellies, diabetes runs in my family. And I just decided I am not going to carry this weight into my fifties. I am not going to do it. I'm not going to be that guy that has the giant belly. And I don't care what I have to do. If I have to get cut off, if I have to kill myself, you know, I don't care. I am absolutely determined to get rid of this. And uh, and it was easy because I figured out how to eat instead of, you know, for me, eating all those potatoes and, and I love pasta. I love spaghetti. I used to have a great spaghetti recipe. I made it all the time. And uh, I just had to let go of all that. And the only thing that I still have are the rice noodles and pho, pho whatever it is. And uh, egg rolls and stuff, but that's very, you know, that's a treat. I don't eat ice cream. I don't eat candy bars. I don't eat energy bars. I don't eat chocolate. None of that stuff. None. It's an aesthetic. When I'm on the road, I eat beef jerky and macadamia nuts. That's what I eat. And I will eat that for, you know, I'll eat that for, for three meals a day until I, uh, until I'm literally dizzy. And then I'll stop at a truck stop and get a steak and eggs and, you know, but I still won't eat carbs. I'll just get more protein. And uh, I, I swear by it. I think it's great. And I'm sure doctors are like, oh my God, no. But, I mean, there, I, there are carbs in broccoli. And if you eat a lot of green vegetables, you can do it. You just have to make sure that you get. So when you go to Chili's or, you know, uh, what's the other one everyone goes to? Applebee's. If you're going to eat on the road, you order the steak with no, don't order the steak with the peppercorn sauce and the other stuff. Just get the basic steak, nothing on it, a salad, no dressing with some lemon on the side from the bar and broccoli and eat that. And it's, you'll miss the potatoes for a while, but you're still getting the carbs from the broccoli and the green beans and everything else. And, you know, then if you need to, you can get some rice like wild rice or brown rice and, and uh, just eat that. So, but it's just a, this, it's a discipline and I feel better. I got to tell you, I feel better. We've talked about this. I feel better. Um, on a protein diet, I feel a lot better. I don't know. I, I don't really notice I'm not as sluggish. I feel stronger. Um, and I'm, I'm, I look at my, I mean, I'm older. I look at myself in the mirror and I'm, you know, I, I, I feel more like I did when I was 15, when I weighed about 95 pounds than I do, uh, than I did during my, my thirties where I was just fat, you know, cause I was stress eating and we'd go to the diner every day and have meatloaf and mashed potatoes and stuff. So. Well, that's quite a testimony, a testimony too. You know, I, I noticed for myself too, the mo- motivation stays high when you're tuning into how good you feel. You know, it, do, it, it stops becoming a mental battle and it's almost not even a choice. You're like, I'm not going to have that piece of whatever because I know how bad I'm going to feel 
tomorrow right. and I won't get to do the other things that I want to do. And I, especially if you're doing intense types of workouts, you really feel the consequences. And it's a, it's a good kind of motivation I've, I've found. Oh yeah. And you know, I mean, if, if, if you have a physical practice, you want to be able to do that physical practice. And, um, you, you know, I think it's healthier. You know, I can't imagine that drinking Diet Coke and eating mashed potatoes three times a week and eating the bread at the restaurant and having toast with breakfast and English muffins and cinnamon and uh, and cream cheese um, bagels from Einstein's, which are delicious, you know, and carrot cake three times a week, you know, because you're having business dinners. Uh, I can't imagine that that is uh, a good thing but people do it all the time. And then there's the alcohol, you know, that people are drinking a lot of beer, Mm -hmm. you know, and when you're 23, you can do that. You know, there's no consequences to it. But when you're, when you're 43, it starts to become a problem and you will have chronic medical problems later in life if you do that. And I just decided I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I don't care if I die, you know, now, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to or want to, but I'm not, I'm, I'm much happier and I was willing to do whatever I had to do to get rid of that because I just don't want to be like that, you know? And now I, I can do stuff. I can do stuff that people my age can't do. And I, I, I do, I am at the age where people I know are literally dropping dead. They just die. And uh, hopefully that won't be me because they have chronic problems that can't be addressed. They're, they've got all people I know, you know, they're constantly breaking legs. They're in the hospital because they fell down and hit their head because they weigh 290 pounds. They, you know, they have a lot of problems and that's avoidable at any age, I think. I mean, you know, you'd be surprised how many, how many people I know that are 65 years old that employ these tools, not eating that stuff and lose weight really fast, you know, and feel way better too. So there's no age limit to it. And it, and then it doesn't become about the weight, you know, especially when you're going for health and performance, the weight doesn't become an issue. Like you said, it just comes off. It's like a, a great consequence. Right. And then I see people who are, I see people who are, you know, I, I don't know how to refer to them. Um, you know, bigger people who are do yoga. Fantastic. They have a great practice. It's not a way it's not weight is not the issue. It's being healthy. So you know, I see, I see women and men of all different sizes and shapes in yoga and, and, uh, some of them really kick ass and they're not little people. Let's just put it that way, but that you don't have to be, you don't have to be a stick. You know, there, everybody thinks of yoga and they think of the, the, they think of the girl who's 22, who weighs literally 96 pounds and she's amazing. She can do all that stuff. But there are also people who are 45 who are, you know, a little chunky, but they have a great practice. So it doesn't, I mean, I'm still kind of chunky in that respect. I'm certainly not 95 pounds. Um, then I could do side crow if I was 95 pounds, but, uh, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not, you're not targeting a, a body shape. You just, you just want to be in an equilibrium of being healthy and not looking down and feeling like you got this giant roll of fat around your, your middle or wherever. Uh, that's just getting in the way that just makes you feel unhealthy. And maybe I've got male anorexia. <laughs> I don't think so. It doesn't sound like it. No, no I love to eat. So. <laughs> but it, it, it sounds like, you know, I think we intuitively know when we're healthy, you know, um, we know when we, we feel good, we know when things are operating right. And so it isn't, I mean, at first maybe we want to look better for, to fit in a certain pair of, uh, outfit or something or to go to yoga class. But um, I really emphasize in what I talk about on the podcast about you tune into how you're feeling. Yeah. Not not primarily emotionally, you know, but you've always said that too. You've always said it's not, you know, uh, there's so many complex things with health that, you know, with fitness that people have, you know, these goals that they have to do. And you can go all the way up to the, you know, you could go, you can go all the way up to CrossFit, you know, or, you know, with John martial arts stuff that you can go absolutely to the, to the absolute wall and do military style training. And there are people to do it uh, and love it. You know, the strong men and strong women contests, the CrossFit, you know, uh, you know, competitions that they have. 
and that I, I don't need to do that. If I was 25, I might consider it now, but I, I never liked that kind of fitness. I, I really like yoga. I think yoga is great. I like biking too, but I don't do that anymore. Yeah, I use a hashtag fun fitness that when you find something that you really jive with, you know, it's really easy. It's not exercise anymore. It's no. you're doing something that's fun and that you enjoy. Right. And you've always said that you've always you've always been able to be you you'll I, I remember you saying, well, I, I, I'm eating this because I want to or I'm drinking this glass of wine because I want to. You know, it shouldn't be a prison. You know? Right. We should enjoy life. As I was um, preparing the audience a little bit for this podcast, I sent out a few questions like, you know, what are your uh, weight concern kind of questions? I'm interviewing this person. And one person came back and, and was wondering, she's lost a lot, you know, like, over 100 pounds. Wow. She's like, I'm, I'm worried about it coming back. And she's like, I, I wonder if, if this guest, too, is ever concerned about it, you know, coming back. How would you respond to that? Well, if I don't order carrot cake at Barbette six days a week, and if I don't eat cheesecake, and if I don't drink Coca-Cola, and if I don't eat bread when I go to a restaurant, I can take a piece of bread off and eat it. But once you make a lifestyle change, you have to, you can never go back. Can't go back to the chips. If you're watching television, you got to, I eat macadamia nuts. Although I do, I did buy some uh, blue corn chips for a taco salad that, I, that I've been, you know, and every time I do that, you know, that's the one weakness. And I, I bought a bag and then I resolved never to buy another bag, but I'm at the point now where I can have those every now and then. But you know, if I do that too much, I can tell that I see it right away. Um, you just can't, it's a lifestyle change. You just, you cannot go back. Once you go through the door, you can't come back because what's going to happen. You're just going to end up with the same problem again. And then it's a pain to, you know, change your habits again. So whatever it is that you did to lose the hundred pounds, keep doing it and don't ever go back. Just, that's it. You're not on a diet. This is a lifestyle change. Permanent, you know. That's great. And I, do you feel that you're missing out or do you think all the, all the sacrifice is worth it by far? Well, I mean, I've let go of that stuff. I don't, you know, I don't, I quit drinking years ago and I've never missed it. You just, I put it out of my mind. It's like, don't do that anymore. It's not an option. And, uh, you know, I will, the food is different because you want to have, when you're at a festive location, you know, if you've ever had the carrot cake at Barbette, you're going to want to have that because it's amazing. And they bring you a piece the size of a semi, you know, um, but, and I will have it every now and then, but I don't, I don't have it four days a week. I used to go over there three, four days a week and have carrot cake and coffee. And you can't, you just can't do that anymore. It's, I don't miss it. I don't think about it unless I'm there and somebody says, Hey, we should have carrot cake. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> you know, but does it make the carrot cake that much better? Yes. It's a, re it should be a reward. Same with cheesecake. You can have it. You just can't have it 16 times a month. You know, you can have corn chips. You just can't do it all the time. You, you know, you, you can, you know, and I never eat potato chips. I would never even buy potato chips. I would never buy popcorn. Occasionally I've bought popcorn with no whatever. Um, and I feel, I feel like, I feel horrible after I eat it. I, I just, you can't have Snickers bars anymore. You can't have that stuff. It's just no, no longer a choice. And is it willpower or is it just saying that's over? Those days are over. You know, I don't do that anymore. So I didn't prepare you for this, but uh, you're good on your feet. So what what would might be a parting message that you would say to people who who were the former Bob types and who are really just ready to make a change? I really believe in the protein thing. Um, some people struggle with it, and I think it's back to your body types. You know, you have to figure out what works for you, and you have to do it until it produces a result. You can't try it for three days and then go back to whatever you, the, the protein thing will start working after a couple of weeks and then you'll lose a lot of weight really fast. It will, you'll notice it. Um, it's not a, you know, I don't believe in this lose three pounds thing. You know, if, if, if I need to take whatever I need to take, whatever I need to do, you know, that within reason that I need to do it. And if, and if it's not eating potatoes for the rest of my life, okay, fine. And that's, that's what I, that's what you do. And if, but you have to make a strong commitment to doing it. Um, and 
you just got to do it. You know, I mean, I hate to say just do it. It's a cliche, but you just have to say, I am going to do this because I want to live longer. I want to be healthier. I want to look better. I want to be able to do the stuff that I want to do. And I'm going to do it. And that's it. And I'm not going to eat that stuff. Even if somebody puts carrot cake in front of me, I'm not going to eat it because I ate it yesterday or last week, you know? Um, and it doesn't matter what it is or where it is or what you're eating. There are always options that you can take that you don't, you don't, you can need to get the uh, cheese butter. Well, the cheese butter is pretty good, <laughs> but uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Yep. We had a little bit of a glitch, but now I can hear you. Um, the cheese butter is always good, but uh, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with butter and fat. I mean, you'd have to read about the diet, but whatever th you do as a lifestyle change, you have to, that's what they mean by lifestyle change. It's permanent. It's not a couple of weeks and then you're going to be fine because that's even worse. I mean, that's worse for your health, as you know, uh, going, you know, seesawing weight is really bad. So if you resolve to lose it, then you just got to do it. And uh, exercise, I would just say, do what you can uh, and don't, you know, when I would do these things where I would say, I'm going to exercise and I went, I've got this plan. Oh yeah. That's what I was talking about. All these plans that you, you know, you have to do this on Thursday and that on Friday and it's too complicated. And who's going to follow that? You know, people with those things on their phones that tell them, <laughs> I guess if it works for you, but I, I don't understand that. You know, it's, it's, it's about a lifestyle choice. That's the best thing I can tell you. And it's, it's support your body. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about the protein diet. You're not talking about starving yourself, but, you know, get some nutritious food also healthy fats. And I've seen you eat piles of broccoli. <laughs> I love broccoli. You know, I, anything green is, is good, I think. But, uh, you know, there's little things like you got to be careful. You don't eat tomatoes because tomatoes are a fruit. Basically I should eat fruit. You know, I've been yelled at for that by my friends that are like, if you don't start eating fruit, but I, I don't eat fruit. I get, I use lemons. You know, I, I use a lot of limes and lemons. So I'm getting citric acid and fruit juice, so to speak. Um, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, I don't ask anybody what to do. I just do what I want. And, you know, it's usually pretty extreme. <laughs> and then I pick up stuff in conversations like I do with you. Oh, that's interesting. I'll try that. Now, maybe that's a fire sign thing. I don't know, or whatever you call it, the fire body type thing. Yeah, usually fire types don't want to be told what to do. So, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. I I'll, I'll figure it out. Once I decide I want to do it, I'll figure it out. You start trying to instruct me and I'm just going to revolt. So, well, that's the thing about fire types too is they'll just dive in. They'll go they'll decide that they're going to do it and they'll dive into finding the answers. Yeah, and you didn't you say that people have little elements of different body types in there? So, um people out there that don't have a lot of fire borrow a little fire from somebody then it that's what it takes you know exactly and uh, uh I, I don't know what else to say i mean i'm not an expert in any of this i just know what i did well i think the the great example is you know i wanted to bring you on as as a guest who found your own way you know you found what works for you and um and you know, you say you don't consume fruits, but yeah, you're having lemons and limes and that provides a lot of nutrients there and you know, everybody will find their way. And, um, yeah, I totally appreciate you being so willing. Like I sent you the email and you're like, yeah, when, when, <laughs> so I really appreciate you being so willing to share well, your story. Doing this is like breathing for me. So it's not, this is nothing just coming on and whatever it's, it's, it's part of my life. So, and it's really fun to try different new systems out and stuff like that technology wise. So I'm really having fun doing this. Totally. Well, for those who want to hear more from you, where can they find you? The Bob Davis podcasts.com. It's and all right there. If they can stand the intensity of it's just, I'm just as intense with that stuff as I am about the other stuff. I'm pretty numb. I remember one time at Bikram, I was like, I love this. Why can't I get rid of this belly? And the teacher said, you got to stop eating that friggin' soup. <laughs> that was the foe that I was, I'd have it twice a day, you know, because I loved it so much. He was like, you got to stop eating that. And I was, and I was so mad at her for telling me, I was like, how dare she? That's so funny. But it finally, it, it was what got through to you, huh? Yeah, it finally sunk in. <laughs> I, well, I'll include the links as well um, to your podcast in, um, in the show notes. And um, thanks again so much. It was totally a pleasure. I knew it was going to be a blast.
Well, send me your links and I'll stick them in the next podcast too. So I'll talk about this because you know, I usually don't talk about this stuff. I'm not, I do a little bit, but not as much as, you know, as I have here. So that's kind of neat. Cool. Well, that'd be a total pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. See you later.